Without further ado then, our first speaker is uh, Val McDermid, author and social commentator. I'm sure I don't need to tell you too much about her, but let me just say a little. Her novels have been translated into 40 languages. They've sold over 16 million copies worldwide. She has received many literary prizes, grew up in Kirkcaldy, went on to study English at St. Hilda's College, Oxford, where she was the first student to ever be admitted from a Scottish state school. Would you give her a huge round of applause for this song? We should not be here. We should not exist. I say this not as some profound philosophical point, but because it's a moral truth. Fifty years ago, a group of people got together in this city and decided to start a campaign to end homelessness. They thought it might take between 10 and 15 years to achieve that goal. Fifty years ago. Incidentally, that's three years more than the average lifespan of a homeless person living on the streets. We're here tonight because, in spite of our best efforts, we have failed. Nobody in that Edinburgh living room thought they'd still be fighting this particular social injustice 50 years on. They believed at the very least that they'd help to make things better. But in spite of their best efforts, and I'm not suggesting for a moment here that Shelter Scotland hasn't made an enormous positive impact, things have got worse. A couple of months ago, I read the following staggering statistic. One person in every 200 in England and Wales is homeless either sleeping rough or living in temporary accommodation. In London, the proportion's even higher, one in 53. The economic geographer Danny Dorling has said, you could argue that the census form should start to ask, have you ever been homeless? And if so, when and for how long? We talk a lot about social justice here in Scotland. We pride ourselves on championing a more equal society than in other parts of the UK. But the progress we have made on homelessness simply doesn't match the rhetoric. We compile our figures differently from England, but there's still no hiding place. If we classified homelessness as an illness, because it's like an illness in terms of the devastation it causes in the lives of those who suffer from it. If we classified homelessness as an illness, there would be a public outcry. It would be the lead story on the news every night. Headlines every day, still no cure for killer disease. Remember when the AIDS epidemic hit back in the 1980s, there was no escaping its existence. The search for a cure became all consuming in pharmaceutical circles. If homelessness was an illness, we'd be demanding a cure. We'd be holding politicians' feet to the fire on a daily basis. Last year, nearly 30,000 Scottish households were classified as homeless. That translates to 80 households losing their homes every single day. Those households contained more than 14,000 children. That's an average of 38 children losing their home every single day. Imagine a disease that caused serious chronic damage to a whole primary school class every single day. How could we bear that? But that is the scale of the problem here in Scotland right now. 50 years on from that first decisive meeting in Richard Holloway's living room. For most people, it's a problem that's easy to ignore. It's easy to dismiss people living on the pavements begging or busking badly. They're not like us. They're junkies or jakies. They're the ones that have failed, not us. And that lets us off the hook. That excuses us from looking beyond the obvious. And that's where we fail. Because the rough sleepers we pass on our way to work or to the pub or to the theatre are only the visible tip of the iceberg. Homelessness goes far beyond people living on the street. You can be homeless with a roof over your head, but if it's not a safe and secure and appropriate roof, then you're suffering from the same disease. You can be defined as homeless if you're sleeping on the streets, if you're sofa surfing with friends or family, if you're staying in a hostel or bed and breakfast hotel, if you're living in overcrowded conditions, if you're living in fear of violence in your home, if you're living in the sort of appalling conditions that have a profound impact on your health, 
If you're living in a house that's not suitable for you because you're sick or disabled. My working life involves the exercise of imagination. Every day I sit down at the keyboard and I think myself into other people's shoes. When I was asked to speak at this event, I set myself the challenge of thinking what it would be like to fall into one of those groups. I say challenge because I've never stood on the cliff edge of not knowing where I was going to sleep that night. I've been lucky. I've been skinned. I was a hard up student, a poor trainee journalist, a broke baby writer coppering up every month to pay the bills. But my life was never so precarious that I never had somewhere to lay my head. So I went for a walk around the city and I tried to imagine what it would look like through the eyes of someone, someone who had nothing and nowhere. You see the city in a very different way. Where can I sit down? Where can I go to keep warm? Where can I pee? How can I get new glasses? Where can I go when it's raining? Where can I wash? Who will talk to me? How long can I sit in McDonald's with the cheapest burger? How can I stop hurting? Will I ever see my kids again? Are that bunch of drunks going to give me a doing? Will someone steal my stuff if I go to sleep? A couple of hours of that and I felt exhausted and drained. And I knew I could make it stop any time I wanted to. Those anxiety levels don't only afflict people living on the streets. We've got a whole new stratum of society these days that we've had to invent a name for, the precariat. People living right on the financial edge. People we can't just loftily dismiss as feckless. I'm talking about people who go to work every day, sometimes doing two or even three jobs to support their families. One in five people in Scotland are defined as living in poverty after their housing costs. They rely on food banks to put dinner on the table. They're just one pay packet or one car repair away from financial disaster. The rent arrears mount. The eviction order is granted. The family splits under the stresses. Mum and the kids are in the sort of bed and breakfast nobody would stay in from choice. And Dad's living in his car <coughs> till the tax and the MOT run out. We don't like to think of this as what life is like for a fifth of the population in modern Scotland. A fifth of our people whose life chances are constricted and constrained. A fifth of our people who are pushed to the margins. They don't feel part of anything. They're outsiders. They're homeless both in the literal and the metaphorical sense. I want to talk a little bit about my own sense of home. I left Scotland when I was 17 because I knew I was an outsider. I didn't really understand why I felt that way. I thought it was because I wanted to be a writer and writers were supposed to have a sense of detachment, a splinter of ice in the heart, as Graham Greene put it. I didn't understand the real reason because I had no vocabulary for it. In Fife in the late 60s and early 70s, you'd have been more likely to find a unicorn than an out lesbian. <laughs> there were no templates for a life that didn't conform to narrow ideas of sexuality. No lesbian movies, no lesbians in the soap. No lesbian novels except The Well of Loneliness. And when I read that, I decided I couldn't be a lesbian. Because <laughs> I didn't want to wear men's suits, I didn't want to be called Stephen, and I didn't want to kill myself. <laughs> Luckily for me, in my last year at university, I found the feminists, and through them, the lesbians. <laughs> I found myself. Yes. 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 I went back to Scotland a couple of years later. I wanted to go home now I felt at home with myself. And I discovered pretty quickly that being a woman on the news desk of a Scottish national newspaper was hard enough. Being an uncompromising lesbian was like living in a perpetual battlefield. The culture of the country I belonged to was, broadly speaking, misogynist and homophobic. So I ran away to Manchester, which was a different country in more ways than one. I could be myself there. The only problem, and I know this might seem odd to some people, was that I felt I was living in exile. England is not my home. Different history, different culture, different sense of humour, different sensibility. And from a distance, I saw Scotland changing. I saw a country that was having a debate with itself about what we wanted modern Scotland to be, what modern Scotland should be. I came back to Scotland five years ago because Scotland has changed in so many ways. We've transformed ourselves in so many ways. In terms of equality and social justice, it's unarguable that we have come a long way. We have a woman first minister. 
We've seen political parties led by people who identify as gay and bisexual. BAME Scots are just as Scottish as the Peely Wally ones like me. We welcome refugees into the heart of our communities. But the job's a long way from finished. We're nowhere near as fabulous as we'd like to think we are. I won't be happy with modern Scotland till everybody who lives here has a home here. It's easy to make the right noises, to say the right words, but we need to hold politicians to account to make them deliver on those words. The trouble is, homelessness isn't sexy. It's not a vote winner because, by definition, the homeless don't have a vote. There's no homeless pride march stretching through the city streets on a sunny summer afternoon. If we don't notice the damage being done to a fifth of our population, how will we notice when it's fixed? We'll notice because Shelter Scotland will be closing its doors. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing? I'm sorry I've subjected you to a bit of a rant. I don't want your takeaway from what I've said tonight just to be about rage and despair though, because you know and I know that we can choose to be better. This is a room full of people whose hearts and minds are engaged with this issue. We can be ingenious. We can work out how to make housing a human right, how to use the resources we have to put decent roofs over people's heads, how to regulate and tax the short stay letting that's hollowing out our cities, how to let everyone come home. From the micro to the macro, we can choose to be better. We can find the optimism and we can infect our politicians with it. We can make them choose to be better too. And maybe long before the next 50 years are up, we won't need Shelter Scotland anymore. Thank you. Thank you.